chapter 3 of your Bible, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, before his human birth, had this to say in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. There's something about Jesus Christ that has not changed through the ages. His methods, the way he carries on his operation. And then in the New Testament of the Bible, once again, it confirms the Old Testament. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus Christ used the same modus operandi that he has used all through the centuries. So the Lord God of the Old Testament, who was the Lord God of the Holy Prophets, according to Revelation chapter 22, and Jesus Christ of the New Testament are the same individual. Now in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, We've read this many, many times, but this is a key and pivotal scripture for the understanding of the entirety of the Bible. In John 1, verse 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So every single thing that was made was made by the Word who was with God, and that Word was also God. Then in verse 14, And the Word was made flesh. Jesus Christ came into human flesh. He is the one who is the Savior, the Old Testament God that revealed to us there was a Father, came in, to the flesh, to die, to become the Savior of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, once again, laying the foundation for the rest of the sermon. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 4. You cannot read this too much because it buries in our mind, once again, who Jesus really was. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all drink the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Jesus, the Christ of Almighty God, was the individual who led ancient Israel out of Egyptian bondage. They led them and baptized them in the Red Sea. They brought them into the promised land. So it was a type in the Old Testament of the future where Jesus, or the God of the Old Testament, led physical Israel into the promised land. So it is that Jesus Christ of the New Testament is going to lead us into the kingdom of God and Israel into the millennium and out into eternity, into the kingdom and the promised land. Now, this Jesus Christ of the Old Testament, who also is of the New Testament, communicated in Old Testament times with his people. He communicated with them through dreams and visions. Notice now in Genesis chapter 20, verse 3. God came to this man in a dream. Notice verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are but a dead man. For the woman that you've taken, she is a man's wife. So what happened was that Abraham, in spite of being the father of the faithful, and I want everybody to note this and be encouraged by it, Abraham was the father of the faithful, and yet he let down on occasions, and he lied about his relationship with his own wife. They were half brother and sister, but they married each other. And so when he went into this man's domain that he ruled over, he said, tell him that you're my sister, because when they look upon you and you're so beautiful, they'll kill me and take you to be their wife. So Abimelech, in all of his innocency, he had no knowledge that she was married to Abraham. 
in his innocency, took this woman to be his wife. And God came to him in a dream to spare him the death penalty. So the purpose of this particular dream and this occasion was to reveal something to the man that could not and was not known to him previously. Abraham and Sarah told Abimelech that they were brother and sister and said nothing of being married. So he was the innocent party in all this triangle. So the penalty for adultery was death. And this was before the Ten Commandments were ever given at Mount Sinai, proving once again that the law has been enforced since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So Abimelech was innocent. So God warned him in a dream and spared his life. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, there was another dream that was given. Notice this particular time. It was Abram before his name was changed to Abraham. Verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. Abram was warned in a vision that he would have a son by Sarah, when you read on down in the context. Not Eliezer, a servant that was a hired man in the house because Abraham could not understand how in the world he was going to have a son through which his progeny would go on except by Eliezer, because his wife Sarah was barren. So Abraham was told in this vision that his personal seed, the offspring between Abram and Sarah, would be as the stars of heaven. You couldn't count them for number. So the purpose of this particular vision was to reveal information to God's servant about the future. So God does deal in dreams and in visions. In Genesis chapter 28, Genesis 28 verse 12 to 16, <clears throat> this is dealing with Jacob. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending. So up and down this ladder from earth to heaven. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. The land whereon you lie to you will I give it and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and in your seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And we know that's through Jesus Christ in a spiritual capacity, but through their seed in a physical capacity in that they became the most educated people and they went around the world preaching Jesus Christ, the Savior. Verse 15, Behold, I'm with you and will keep you in all places whether you go and will bring you again into this land. For I will not leave you until I've done that which I've spoken to you of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. So here, Jacob dreamed. He had promises of numerical seed that would be through his lineage as it was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and now on down to Jacob. And he was promised that God Almighty, who is Jesus Christ in the New Testament, because the Father was never revealed as yet, that he would never leave the seed of Israel. And as he said in the book of Psalms to King David, even though David's seed, the generations that followed him, would rebel against Jesus and not follow his law. He would still be with them. He would send them into punishments of men and warfare and captivity. Then he would bring them back out of the captivity again, but he would never leave the lineage of Israel. This dream was given as verification of a previous promise to Abraham and assurance that God would be 
with him. Dreams were very important in Old Testament times and visions. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 3 to 11, this has to do with Jacob and then Joseph, his youngest, well, actually his second youngest son besides Benjamin. And this was Joseph's dream. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated Joseph and could not speak peaceably unto him. In other words, they were always sarcastic in their language toward him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray, or I'm asking you, this dream which I've dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. So they bowed down in honor to Joseph. And his brethren said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion or rulership over us? And they hated him yet the more for this dream and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. They bowed down and literally worshipped or not particularly worship, but bowed down before Joseph. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him. He did not understand the significance of what was being said. What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren indeed come to bow down, bow down ourselves to you to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. I want you to notice very carefully now that Joseph's dream was later fulfilled when he saved their lives through a severe famine in the land of Egypt. Joseph was actually sold into Egyptian bondage. Drop down to verse 20. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we'll say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. So he was actually thrown into a pit and kept there. And then some Egyptians came through, and they sold him into Egyptian bondage. Now, chapter 42. But what we have to realize is that this was a dream that was given to Joseph even though the people at that time did not understand the significance of it, nor did they understand the fulfillment of it, it was still a dream that God Almighty, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, put in the Bible. Chapter 42, verse 1 through 6. And when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, and remember, Joseph, when he was down in Egypt, he had dreams about a time of famine and a time of good, good times. And so he harvested for seven years corn, stored it up, put it in bins. And then there were seven years of famine. And this is what affected Jacob and his 11 sons and his wife. Verse 2, and he said, Behold, I've heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get you down there and buy for us from there that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest preadventure mischief befall him. He didn't want to lose his very youngest son. He had already lost Joseph. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among the, those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to 
the earth. So here was literal fulfillment of a dream that they didn't understand and they were trying to persecute this person for the dream. And yet Egypt, or in Egypt, Joseph rose to the number two position in that government. And he was the one fully responsible for saving alive the people of that land and his father and children. Genesis chapter 46. God uses dreams, visions. Verse 1 through 4. Israel took his journey. Israel is Jacob. Well, all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of the father of, uh, his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. So Jacob answered, well, here I am. And he said, I'm God, the God of your father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will make, I will there make of you a great nation. So Joseph was in Egypt. Now Jacob and his whole family, there were 75 total, all of his children and their wives and their children. And he said, don't be afraid to go down into Egypt because I'm going to make a great nation that I promised to Abraham and Isaac. Verse 4, I'll go down with you into Egypt. I'll also surely bring you up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon your eyes. Now, just because God said, I'll go down into Egypt with you, we know that they had a terrible time in the land of Egypt once the Pharaoh who knew Joseph died. And a new Pharaoh came up that didn't know Joseph. So he put the children of Israel into national captivity and bondage. And they were forced to work seven days a week, hard labor, doing all the construction projects in the land of Egypt. And I guess these people grumbled and said, what did God bring us down here for? To kill us? And yet God said, no, I'm going down there with you and I'm going to make a great nation. And I'll be, then I'll bring you out. So the vision was given for a purpose so that they can understand the plans that God was working out. Now, in Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. I'll hit some of this and then skip over some of it, but I'll make sure we get the gist of it. In chapter 12, here is Miriam, Moses, and Aaron. Verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Egyptian woman. In other words, Moses had married an Egyptian woman who was black, and they were white. And so Miriam and Aaron rose up in rebellion against the very person that God called through a burning bush and rose up and accused him before God for this marriage. Now let's go into verse 2. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? In other words, Moses, are you the only one that's in charge here? Aren't we equal to you? Hath, not, hath he not spoken also by us? In other words, Moses was about to have his authority that God had given him usurped by Aaron and Miriam. Notice what happened, though. And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. You know why that parenthetical statement was put in there? Because it told us that Moses in no way was doing anything for these two individuals to rise up against him. He was honest and sincere before God and the most meek man on the face of the earth. To him, he was just plain old Moses. He didn't ask for the job he was given, but God said, you'll do it and you'll perform it. Verse 4, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, you three, into the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. 
And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. Now, it would be a dreadful thing for us if the living God called us out by name because of something we had done and he was about to correct us, we'd probably turn white and our teeth would fall out even though they were fixed by roots. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Notice, God says he will speak to his men in visions and dreams. But notice what he thought about Moses. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark sentences. In other words, I'll be clear with Moses. And the similitude of the Lord shall be behold, or shall Moses behold. Wherefore then, why were you, Miriam and Aaron, not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. I'll just relay the rest of the story. Miriam was the one who fostered this rebellion. She talked Aaron into it. Therefore, since she was the one that was responsible, God caused her to have leprosy as a punishment for seven days. And the children of Israel had to sit still in the burning desert sun for seven days while she was outside the camp with leprosy and her flesh rotting off her body. And then God healed her later. But let all of Israel know, this is my servant Moses. He's in charge here. And I will, through prophets and so on, reveal my will in dreams and visions. But Moses was different. This was a man who was so faithful to God that every accusation against him was false. And God announced it publicly. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 13, God is telling just a little more about how he deals in dreams and in visions with people. Notice what he says about those who would become false dreamers, false prophets, and say that I've dreamed a dream. Verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, so they predict something, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. It literally happens. Wherefore he spoke unto you, saying, Let us go after other gods. In other words, he said, Look, I've proved I'm a prophet of God. What I said came true, didn't it? And then that person leads them into breaking God's law. And it says right here in verse 3, You shall not listen or hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proves you. He allows false prophets to come up who have dreams by demons and visions and those demons make those things happen. But the key is, you'll know whether it's of God or a demon if the man who predicted it tells you to obey the laws of Almighty God or whether he leads you off and says the law of God is done away. It was nailed to the cross. We're under grace, which we are, but they use grace as a license to live a wicked and a disobedient lifestyle. They were told to put that prophet to death because they had the authority to do so. So dreams can come true that are predicted by demons. People who are deceiving, so you must be careful. That's why in 1 John chapter 4, and verse 1, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, we're told by the Apostle John to try the spirits. Notice what it says now, 1 John 1 or 4 verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. 
because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So there are false prophets that are given dreams and visions that are by demons and not by the real God of the Bible. And they, these demons make them come to pass. But the key is whether they tell you to obey God and keep his law or to disobey. If they lead you into disobedience, they're a false prophet. I don't care how many things that they say that comes to pass. If they break God's Sabbath, if they break his holy days, if they break his laws of clean and unclean meats, if they refuse these things, they are a false prophet. In Judges chapter 7, notice verse 13 to 15. Judges 7, verse 13 to 15. This is God dealing with Gideon. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow. So one of his men there, and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of the Midians, and came into the tent, and smote it that it fell. So the tent of the Midians fell, and overturned it that the tent lay alone. And his fellow answered and said, there is nothing else save the sword of Gideon. So this dream is nothing but it's foretelling the sword of Gideon, a man of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. The Midians had Israel in bondage and in servitude at this time. So God was raising up a man, Gideon. Who was going to fight the battle and deliver Israel? And so a dream was given to one of the people who were in the camp. And so they understood the dream to be Gideon and his 300 men would overthrow the Midianites and relieve Israel from bondage. Notice now verse 15. And it was so. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned the, into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into, the, into your hand the host of Midian. Now notice what happened. Gideon, who was a man of God, knew God would use him to perform a mighty work for the Lord. He delivered Israel from the Midianites through the hand of Gideon. And once the dream was given... He knew what he had to do, and nothing would stop him. You can look in your own concordance. Look up the word stirred, and you'll find the story of Gideon that God stirred up. Gideon, the Holy Spirit of God, came upon Gideon. And the word upon, when you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, literally meant wrap around like a coat. So God's Spirit just came upon Gideon like he was wrapped up in a coat and just empowered him, and Gideon knew what he had to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, God began to deal with another individual. There had been no visions in Israel for a long period of time because Eli, the high priest, was old, and his two sons who were to secede him were not obedient to God. They took bribes. They had sexual relations with women coming in to offer their sacrifices in the temple. They were evil. Now notice chapter 3, verse 1 to 15. I'll read parts and summarize parts. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. There were times when God would not show visions because the people were disobedient and he withdrew himself. But when one would arise, an individual that was obedient to God, then once again visions and dreams and the will of God was made known. Verse 2, and it came to pass that at that time Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim. In other words, he was falling off to sleep. 
Now in verse 3, 4, and 5, and 6, little Samuel, young Samuel, was in his bed, sleeping. And all of a sudden he heard a voice three separate times calling Samuel by name. And each time young Samuel got up and went into Eli and woke him up and said, here I am, what did you want? Finally, the third time, notice verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you did call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. So there were no open visions until finally a woman dedicated her son Samuel to God and delivered that young child after he was weaned and old enough to walk and eat to the temple. And Samuel was to live there and become God's servant. And for the first time now in a long time, God had someone that would obey him. But Samuel didn't know who God was yet. He was but a child. Verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down. And it shall be, if he call you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And then God spoke to Samuel. So once again, visions, dreams. And he went on in this vision to relay to Samuel that because of Eli's sons that were disobedient, and because Eli would not have the intestinal fortitudes called guts today to stand up to his own children and stop their rebellion. Because of that, God would destroy the entire family of Eli. And Samuel would take over and replace them. This was revealed in a dream. Now, I'll not discuss Daniel, Ezekiel, and the other prophets who were given dreams and visions for the purpose of writing down Bible prophecy today. But I do want to go to Joel chapter 2. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 31. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 31. The apostles quoted these very verses on the day of Pentecost in chapter 2 as authority for what was happening to them. Verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall see dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So before Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, somebody, somewhere, is going to have dreams and visions. There's going to be prophecies, and it's going to deal with the living God and his people. In Luke chapter 1, in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Zechariah was a priest. He took his turn in the temple yearly, serving God. Verse 21 and 22, And the people waited for Zechariah. He was in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, and the people waited for him to come back out after sacrificing. And they marveled that he tarried or stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. So this was Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. He was given a vision that his wife would conceive and bear a son that would be the forerunner 
leading the way to Jesus Christ and pointing the people to Jesus. Now, Matthew chapter 1. So visions have happened all through the centuries, even from the time of Abraham, to God's people. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, or this is what took place. When is his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph? In those times, you would technically be married, but they called it espoused. And you did not live together for one year. That way you knew whether the woman was pregnant or not before marriage. Before they came together in the normal sexual relationships that makes a marriage binding, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. See, now all of a sudden talk started all over Jerusalem that this woman was pregnant before she legally came into contact with Joseph. Verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Once again, a dream or a vision, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife. See, they were technically married, but they had to be separated for one year to make sure she was not pregnant. In this case, she was, but it wasn't by a human being. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. <laughs> And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Jesus was the son of God because God was the father. And he was also the son of man because Mary was the mother. So he was both God and man, a God man. Verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn, and his name was called Jesus. So here once again was a dream, a vision. Now in Matthew 2, notice verse 12 now. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Here were the wise men that had come two years previously. And they had gone to Herod and said, Look, we've come to find the person, the baby, who was born the Son of God to be king over Israel. So Herod, the old sneaky devil, didn't want to give up his power and authority. So he said, Look, when you find this king, come back and tell me. I want to go worship him. Of course, he was a liar. And so God warned the wise men in a dream or a vision not to go and report it to Herod. So they didn't. And verse 19 to 22, same chapter. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young man child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Now notice verse 22. God gave another dream. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judah in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. So Joseph knew that this young upstart was a deadly individual. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. So once again, dreams were used and visions were used. Turn to Matthew chapter 17 now. Matthew 17, verse 1 to 9. Jesus, before he died, took his disciples 
and he took three of them on with him closer to where he was going to be in prayer. After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them into a high mountain apart. So he was apart from everyone else, separated, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Then, of course, Peter had to speak up. He was impetuous Peter. He was a leader. He was gung-ho. And he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And because of this, this is where people get the idea that Moses and Elijah are going to be the two witnesses at the end of the age. Nothing could be further from the truth. Hebrews 11 says they all died in faith. They're dead. They're in their grave. I'll prove it for the scripture. Verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were afraid. They were terrified. So Jesus came and he touched them and said, Come on, get up, don't be afraid. Now verse 9. Because when they lifted up their eyes, they didn't see a person. Jesus was not shining as the sun in its full strength anymore. They didn't see Moses and they didn't see Elijah. And as they were walking down the mountain, notice what Jesus told them. Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. This was not a real happening. It was a vision. They saw Elijah and Moses in their future glorified state, they saw Jesus in his future glorified state with their new bodies it's to so encourage them that they would go out and be willing to die for their very beliefs. So Jesus, in a vision, showed them what their future glorified body would look like. A vision. It was not really Moses and Elijah. They're not in heaven, they're dead in their grave. Hebrews 11 verse 13 says they all died in faith. Notice now Matthew 27. Matthew 27 verse 19 and 20. When he was set down on the judgment seat, now this was Pilate, Barabbas was offered to be set free instead of Jesus dying, they were going to kill Barabbas and let Jesus go free. Because each year at the Passover time, they had a custom of letting a criminal go free. So when Pilate was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, sent a message, urgent message, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas to go free and destroy Jesus. So see, even dreams and visions on occasions can be given to unbelievers if there is a purpose for it. Only if there's a purpose. Now let's go to Luke chapter 24, verse 22 to 24. Luke 24, verse 22 to 24. Here were some of the women and disciples. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. So these women got to the sepulcher first, after Jesus said, I'll be resurrected from the dead. Now verse 23. And when they found not his body, they came, saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us 
went into the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but they, but him they saw not. So there was even a vision by some of the people of angels telling them. This was not a true occurrence, like I'm sitting here looking at you. You're there. No, they saw in their mind a vision of something that was not real, but it seemed real to them that Jesus had indeed resurrected from the dead. Now, let's take a look for just a couple of minutes now and see if visions continued even in the book of Acts and the New Testament apostles. Not just Old Testament Israel, but New Testament. Chapter 9, verse 16, or 10 to 16. Chapter 9 of Acts, verse 10 to 16. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Because you see, before this, Saul was going to Damascus. He was going in a house-to-house -house search to find disciples, Christians. He was going to put them in prison and even put some of them to death. So he went to Damascus, and all of a sudden, a light shone down from heaven, and Saul saw a vision of Jesus saying, Look, why are you persecuting me? So now he's blind, and he was led into the city of Damascus by the hand. So now a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And of course, Ananias said, Well, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. So here was a double vision. Ananias and Saul both saw a vision, so they knew that the other was to meet with, with him. Coming in and putting his hand on you, that he might receive his sight. Verse 13, Now Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many things of this man, how much evil he's done to the saints at Jerusalem. Saul was not a good man at that time. He thought he was. He thought he was doing God a service by destroying Christians. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. And the Lord said unto him, Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul then was known by his name in the Bible. No longer Saul, but Paul. He was ordained and hands laid upon him and set aside by the Holy Spirit to go and preach. And the Bible says right here in this vision, that he would know how much he would have to suffer for his ministry. Now turn to chapter 10 of Acts, verse 1 through 3. There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And then all of a sudden he saw in a vision an angel coming down and speaking to him and telling him what to do, to call for Peter. And then Peter also, as you read down in the book, the 10th chapter here, that there was also a Peter a vision given to Peter, verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision that he had seen meant, Peter saw a sheep coming down with every unclean animal there was in it. And so he didn't understand because he had already said, look, I've never eaten anything common or unclean, anything strangled with a blood left in it, and anything that was unclean according to your law in Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. So then the vision was given an interpretation in verse 28. And he said unto them, You know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or coming unto another nation. So he couldn't even go into a house that belonged to a Gentile. But 
God hath shown me. And you could insert the words in a vision that I should not call any man, a human being, common or unclean. So this did not do away with God's law of clean and unclean meats. All it did was use one of his laws to show him that human beings are not to be called unclean. So once again, a vision was used. There was a purpose to the vision. God does not just randomly give a vision or a dream. When he gives them, they have meaning. Many of us may dream or have a vision today. Not necessarily a, a vision, but a dream. Because going into our mind, into our brain cells, is all kind of information. And when you sleep, it's sorted out and stored away. And so you can have dreams, and they mean nothing. But when God gives a dream, the person who receives it knows exactly what it's for. In Acts chapter 16, verse 5 to 10. And so are the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This is Acts 16. Now when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, I want to ask a question. How many times have you heard me say, I tried to prepare two or three sermons last week and I couldn't do it. I know this is the sermon I must give today. Have you ever heard me say that? Yes, you have. The Apostle Paul right here tells the answer. Paul was going into a certain area and the Holy Spirit would not let him and put into his mind, no, you're not to go there. Notice what the Holy Spirit did reveal to him though. Verse 7, after they were coming to Mysia, they essayed or they were trying to go on to Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. It would not let them go on and do what they had in mind. And they passing by Mysia came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, or begged him, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Notice, Paul knew without a doubt in his mind that a vision from God came to him and told him to do something, and he was urgent. He couldn't hardly sit still. He couldn't hardly sleep the rest of the night until he got up and packed his tent and took off. He knew God was in action, and Paul had to go and to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 18, of Acts, verse 8 to 11. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house. This is over in Macedonia now. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not your peace. In other words, Paul, I'm going to send you to a territory where you can preach the whole truth. You don't have to fear for your life, for I'm with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt. So nobody was going to attack Paul. He wasn't going to be stoned. He could walk freely through the streets. He could preach the truth uninhibited, for I have much people in this city. And he stayed there for 78 consecutive Sabbaths, a year and a half, and taught the people. So dreams and visions are for the people of God if they are sincere and dedicated. Then God will come to people in dreams and visions to make known the purpose for which they are even actively engaged in the ministry. In Acts chapter 21, this will be my last example. Verse 8 to 14. This has been my introduction into the sermon today. Verse 8 to 14. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. Now notice, Paul had already been told to go into Corinth, and nothing would bother him. He would have a free hand to preach the truth. So Philip the Evangelist, and he had 
which was one of the seven. In other words, one of the seven that they selected to become a deacon and to serve the brethren. And then he became an evangelist because of the fruit of the Spirit in his life. So he spent time with him. Verse 9, And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. What did the Bible say? The young women and maidens would prophesy. And it said, your young men will see dreams. Verse 10, and as we tarried there many days, they just stayed there. There came down from Judea a certain prophet. Now this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Agabus was a prophet of God. Now, the people of that day may not have known it. They may not have recognized that he was a prophet, but the Bible under the inspiration, hindsight is twenty twenty. Agabus was a prophet, and when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, or his belt, that it went around those long flowing robes, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. Here was a prophecy. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle. It belonged to Paul. If Paul went on up to Jerusalem, he would be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place, the people that lived there, Philip and his daughters and those with him, besought Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul said, What do you mean by weeping? You're breaking my heart. I'm not only ready to be bound, but also to go to Jerusalem and die for the name of Jesus. So they couldn't persuade Paul not to go on. Paul had a choice in this particular dream or vision or prophecy. Paul was warned that if he went to Jerusalem, he would be taken. He was given a choice not to go. But if he overrode the choice and went to Jerusalem, he knew his fate in advance. Brethren, has God changed? I read scriptures to begin this message with, showing that the God of Israel, who became Jesus Christ, said, I change not. And then in Hebrews 13, 80, said he was the same yesterday in Old Testament times, today in New Testament times, and forever, even out into eternity. In May and June of 1980, after 14 years of intense study, Many of those years, up to 10 and 12 hours a day, because I had a sales job where I worked three days, three hours a day, three days a week. I was totally free to study the Bible the rest of the time. After 14 years, suddenly, I could see a Bible in living color. Wherever I went, no matter whether I was awake or asleep, that Bible was before my eyes in living color. I could even see the chapters and the verses that it was turned to, whether my eyes were open or shut. The Bible never went away. I had written four articles and had them published in January, February, March, and April of 1980 in another church organization's magazine. I didn't know at this time what was happening to me as an individual. I didn't know why this Bible was before my eyes and it would never go away. I finally revealed this to a friend who had said over and over to me, who worked for me in my advertising business, you've been working too hard, you're tired, I can see it. That's because I hadn't had any sleep in a month and a half, any rest. Of course, I did sleep, you can't go without sleep. But this Bible was there. I consciously, even though I was asleep, knew that Bible was before my eyes. So we studied about how the Holy Spirit stirred different ones in the Old Testament up to perform acts of God. And how the Holy Spirit wrapped around like a coat Gideon. And he was stirred up and go perform the work of the Lord. We sat down in a motel room in Joplin, Missouri, the last two weeks of June in 1980. We came to the conclusion that God was calling me for something. I didn't know what for. I had no idea. This was totally new to me. 
I had already designed a front cover of Newswatch magazine. We came to the conclusion that God wanted me to publish this magazine. I did the first, I took the first four articles that I had ever written, took them to a printer that had done business with me for years. When I laid those four articles down with a design of the front cover of the magazine on his desk in June of 1980, the last week of June, June 23rd to be exact, that Bible disappeared. It has never been there since. But this happened to me just as sure as these things happened to the apostles in the New Testament and it's written I know this happened to me. Nobody on earth has to believe it. But I know it because for two solid months it happened to me. And when something happens to you like that, you know the God of the universe has touched your life and you're going to perform whatever he says. I don't care what the opposition against you comes to be. I was then ordained into the ministry by four men of four different Churches of God organizations. The Biblical Church of God out in California, the Church of God Seventh Day in Denver, Colorado, the Colorado Springs Church of God, and the Unity Church of God in Cleveland, Ohio. A representative of each one of those organizations ordained me. This is the first time since modern records of the Church of God that anyone had ever been ordained across organizational boundaries. No other person has before then or since ever been ordained other than members of their own church group. I'm it. Calvin Burrell of the Church of God Seventh Day prayed the fourth and final prayer of those four ministers as they prayed over me and ordained me into the ministry. He prayed that God would set me aside for the ministry of prophecy. What was so strange about that is that Calvin Burrell believes that all of Bible prophecy was fulfilled with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And yet he prayed that God would set me aside for the ministry of prophecy. That's sort of like making that jackass in the Old Testament talk. When a man does not even believe something, and yet God causes his mouth to say, set him aside for the ministry of prophecy in front of the, all the people that were at the Feast of Tabernacles that year. It has happened ever since that time. And people have taken old tapes, 10, 11, 12 years old, heard them and said, you can see this happen step by step. You haven't missed it yet. Around the Feast of Tabernacles, time of 1983, a man called me from the state of Wisconsin. I didn't know the man. I don't know how he knew of me. I'd never seen him before, didn't even know his name, couldn't tell you his name today. He gave me his name by phone, but I thought it was a silly phone call at the time, so I didn't remember his name. He stated to me by phone, I have a prophecy from God to give to you concerning your ministry. You can either accept it or reject it. I know you don't know me. But I have to say this to you. He said, I've opened my Bible. Would you open yours with me to Isaiah 54, verse 17? This is what this man read to me. No weapon that is formed against you. And he said, your ministry shall prosper. I've had person after person after person rise up against me, trying to take the flock away from me, those that came and said, I want to help you, Dave. And then they would try to take a following after themselves. One man even ran off the entire mailing lift. He was, he was a Commodore computer expert when we had a Commodore computer and left while I was gone visiting an elderly lady. That was theft. He could be in prison for it. And yet the man is destitute today living out of his car. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. 
and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment shall you shall condemn. In other words, those who have spread rumors and lies and slander against me in this generation, in this lifetime, when they come up in judgment, I will have the opportunity to condemn them. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. I want it clear. The understanding I have of this Bible is from Jesus Christ. He is the one that gave it to me. I take no credit for it. I never have. And anyone who's heard tapes over a period of years know I have never exalted myself. I've never called myself an apostle, a prophet, or an evangelist, or anything else. I've only said I'm a minister of Jesus. You make the decision for yourself what I am or am not. God Almighty gave this to that man. I've seen it through the years. I've seen the attacks upon me, and it has come true all the way through my ministry. And I've stood there, never defended myself from one person. And yet, those individuals who have risen up against me and slandered me and lied about me and tried to destroy me personally and this ministry have fallen on the rocks. And you know what? Not one of those people that have ever left have baptized a single person. Not one of them even has a church other than their own immediate family. This is what God said through this man. I didn't know whether to believe it or not. I wouldn't repeat it to anybody. But through the years, it has happened. At the Feast of Tabernacles in Hardy, Arkansas, in October of 1985, a person came to me with great urgency to tell me of a dream concerning me. Within three and a half months, the dream came true. I was told to watch behind my back that another minister had already begun at the Feast of Tabernacles taking people into his and his wife's living quarters and trying to convince them that I was wrong concerning the keeping of Passover. By the end of January 1996, three and a half months after the dream had been given to me, ten people affiliated with this ministry all called within an hour and a half space on one Friday night this has never happened before then and never happened since then. Every one of them reported to me the same thing, that this particular man and his wife were disrupt, disrupting the church and they had to be stopped at all cost. They compel me to impose Romans 16 verse 17 to mark them because they were causing division in the church. I knew this was from the Holy Spirit of God because 10 people have never called me before or since. At any time, in any one day, must last within an hour and a half period, and every one of these people were the leaders in different areas. So we did. That dream came true concerning this ministry. I've told people many times, if you want to get close to me and this ministry, get ready for some hard knocks because the God of the universe is behind this ministry. I didn't ask for it, but he called me. I've got to do it. I can't neglect what God has called me to do. On the first day of unleavened bread, I cannot remember which year. My brain cells would not recall the memory, whether it was 1987 or 1988. A person from Texas came to me in the Brentwood Community Center where we had our services. This person had never seen the room where we held services. Yet, when this person walked in the door to tell me about this dream, they became faint and weak in the knees and said, this is the very room I saw in this dream. The dream was that a woman shot me in the back. The later fulfillment was not a physical shooting, but it was just as deadly to the church. A woman began to slander me behind my back, and it took four years to discover, because everybody was afraid to come to me and say anything to me. Then finally, desertion and abandonment, with the admission to a church member 
that is in good standing to this very moment that this woman wanted to destroy me and personally destroy the church. The slander behind my back was to destroy my reputation and some of the most powerful demons that Satan had, according to another person who had the gift of discernment of spirits, was with this person. And so, in 1989, the fulfillment began to happen in earnest. But not one person in the church that this person slandered behind my back my reputation could ever find and point out one sin. Not one. And anybody that that person spoke to, and they came to me about things, they had to admit they could not find one thing that they openly saw me commit as a sin. Satan and his demons were working overtime. Yet I didn't know why this happened until two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago. I had been alone as a direct result of what happened to me working in this ministry because I had had adultery, slander, and abandonment against me years before. And I had been deserted and working in this ministry alone with no help I had made up my mind that I would never even consider marrying again because I wouldn't chance the opportunity of that person falling away from the church and wrongfully reproaching the ministry of God, which he had called me to. Because I read that scripture in Isaiah 54, 17, and it scared me to death. It said, my righteousness, God's righteousness, I will give to my servants. So I know that I'm nothing And I know that I have every pull of the flesh like everybody else, but God has given me the power to control it. And I have, and I lie not before God. In 1990, I received a telephone call from another state. Was asked to help someone in the state of Missouri who was going through the worst trial of her life. The person that called had seen a vision but did not tell me about the vision. This person just asked me to go and help this woman. Later on, after I did, the person that called me said, I saw in a vision a person who was being prepared, who was being converted, who was becoming dedicated and loyal that God was going to put in your life as a help suitable. Without the first person's knowledge, a second person had a vision that I was at an altar with this same woman to be married in the future. And both people saw the same person. Meanwhile, two other people had been praying that I and this same woman, and none of these people knew that they had seen visions and dreams separate from each other. None of them even knew the other had it. They had seen visions that God would cause us to meet and to know each other other than just a first name. They already knew us, that both of us personally, they knew our personalities. That's why they were praying that God would bring us together because we were identical in every way. We were just like clones. Only one of them was a man and the other was a woman. That's all. But they thought about like, acted alike. Both of them were crazy. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. And that somehow, amazingly, these dreams have come to pass stage by stage. Some of it has already happened and other of it is in the process of happening. All of this separate and apart from any of those people's knowledge, they were having the various dreams and visions. In 1990, Three different people had other dreams that related to each other. God was showing us something that we did not understand that was going to happen to this ministry until April 20th, 1991. I'm going to call some names now. Frank 
plus who has been loyal to this church since day one that he was baptized. He has done everything even over and beyond anything that could ever be expected of him in this ministry. He had a dream that snakes were around my neck, choking me to death. About the same time, another person, Brenda Bunzelmeyer, at that time was her name, had a dream that I was beheaded. In March of 1991, another man from another state rose up at 1.30 in the morning with a burning desire to write a letter to some people that were called leaders in the St. Louis church here. The letter was written and mailed without my knowledge. He sent me later, a couple of days later, a copy of the letter. He sent it to, and addressed it to the leadership of the St. Louis church, seven individuals. It stated that God's spirit had caused him to write this letter telling the leadership of the St. Louis church that they should get behind David Smith spiritually and clean up their lives and physically with their donations because none were donating and they were the leaders. Or God would destroy that church and start all over with only the handful of faithful few. On April 20th, 1991, these people gathered after church services in the morning and all but a couple left early or didn't even come to church. They spent all afternoon plotting a coup d'etat, how they were going to vote on all decisions and that Dave Smith, whom God had called as a minister, could not make decisions for the church. Anything would be decided by a vote of the majority of those individuals. Therefore, eliminating me from preaching unabated the truth of God without fear. God warned three people of what they were trying to do. Not to kill me and chop my head off, not choke me to death, but to spiritually kill the church by muzzling the Holy Spirit working inside of me. God's Spirit led me after I went down and met with these people. I turned in the driveway. Brenda and I did and saw all of these cars here. And so we went and stopped and prayed before we entered into that building. God's Spirit, after this was over, led my mind to dissolve the church. Just like the person had written a letter 30 days before and said, if you don't get behind Dave Smith spiritually by cleaning up your lives and then physically by tithes and offerings to support the church, I'll kill the church and start all over. And it happened exactly 30 days later. They were given opportunity to be corrected of the Holy Spirit of God and they were not. We dissolved the church, and the only people that we asked to come to services were the people in this room today. The people in this room, plus the new people that have come since, was shown to me by the Holy Spirit of God that they had a sincere heart, a perfect attitude toward God, wanting to live and obey God to the very best of their ability, and they would not compromise with sin. And he showed me that he would start with a base, just like he did with Gideon. Gideon started out with 10,000 men against the Midians. And God said, I want to show my glory. So he got rid of 9,009 or 700 of those people. And with 300 small men in an army, he destroyed the whole country of Midian. So God showed me that he was going to start from scratch with a handful of beautiful people in his sight and build a ministry. I didn't know what he was going to do. I had no idea. It was so discouraging to me after all the years that I'd spent in the ministry in the St. Louis church. And all of a sudden, what was I going to do now? 
Brethren, all the hardships that I personally have had to endure was only a preparation for the task ahead. I've had no personal dreams. I've had no visions. But we have had no visions as a church for two years. Only peace and harmony since April 20th, 1981. I have not changed the message of the coming kingdom of God. First to be preceded by a counterfeit, the false antichrist system. And I have never changed the message. One iota of preaching the law of Almighty God. God is now ready to use me personally for whatever he has been preparing me for for the last 13 years. As you know, and I've already said, I have never once claimed to be anybody or anything. I only know what God did when he called me. Several people have asked me, if I have ever had the urge to buy a piece of ground out of way in the country somewhere, and I answered them every time, no. But when God is ready, he will move me by the Holy Spirit in such a capacity that he'll stir me that I will know that I am to do something. Mother's Day rolled around, May 9th, 1993. Brenda and I promised her mother, Tiny, that we would take her down to visit with her sister, Brenda, or her other daughter, Brenda, in Texas. While we were there, we went visiting a sightseeing place that's quite famous. As we got in the car and I sat there, I just said, I don't know why I'm in St. Louis. It was like the Holy Spirit of God just came upon me and created such an urgency in me to transfer our national headquarters from St. Louis, Missouri to the southwest suburbs of Dallas, Texas. I had no idea why. I thought at first I knew why, but I was wrong. I thought because of 13 years in St. Louis and outside of our own local family, we only have 13 loyal members to the church. I thought maybe that because Paul... God told Paul to go to another city where he had much people, that he wanted me to shake the dust off my shoes to St. Louis, except for that beautiful few people, and then move to another area. After all, I've had nothing but heartache and sorrow in those 13 years, and only 13 converts that have been loyal. But on June 10th, 1993, it became clearer not fully clear yet. When we went back to Texas a second time, two weeks after Mother's Day, to finalize the preparation of the beginning of a church home down there, a man came to me. He told me that he had a dream. He said, I wanted to make sure that you were really going to move to Texas first before I told you this dream. He said, I'll not tell you all the dream. I'll save some of it for later. I'll only tell you parts. He said that he had a dream, that he knew that we were going to move our national headquarters to Dallas, Texas, in the suburbs. He dreamed that I would move to Texas, and the message that God would give me would be so powerful and so outstandingly received that the ministry would become financed by Texans, by leaps and bounds, so the rest of the nation could hear the, the message and the warning and it would go out into Canada also. But there's one part of the message or the dream that he told me that I won't say publicly. I'll only allude to it. Because if I were to tell you what he said, probably every person in the room's hair would fall off to the ground right now. It would be so dramatic and so powerful. If this becomes reality, I will reveal it. Then on June 10th, Thursday night, less than two weeks ago from this message, a man by the name of Harold Dixon that everyone here knows, except maybe one or two, called me on that night. He said, since you're going to Texas, 
I have to tell you something. But before I tell you what Harold Dixon said, here's what Brenda said to me, or I said to her. Ever since we went to Texas and I came back, I said something keeps running through my mind. Two words. The gathering. The gathering. It just comes through my mind daily. I don't know why. Here's what Harold Dixon said to me. He said, Dave, I was listening to shortwave radio about six weeks ago. This would have been the last week of April or around April 1st, before I ever went to Texas and before God ever stirred me up to want to leave and to move our headquarters to Dallas, Texas. He said, I was listening on short wave to a man by the name of Brother Stair who said three times that he learned the Sabbath and the Holy Days from you. He was interviewing a man on short wave live. The man was from Montana. And the man said, I had a vision from God. He said, and I'm quoting what Harold Dixon said to me, you can verify it with him. He recorded it on tape. He said, God's servant, David J., was to lead the in-gathering of God's elect from a western state. This was before I ever went to Texas, before God ever stirred me up to move to Dallas, Texas. Cold chills went all over me because I'd kept telling Brenda the words, the gathering kept going through my mind. And when Harold Dixon, who didn't even know we were going to move to Texas, called me and said he heard this and said, the in-gathering of the elect. I'm telling you, goosebumps came all over me and chills came all over me because you see, in closing my message today, I want you to understand something. Texas is the only state in the Union that can, by treaty, come out from under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. They signed on with the United States as a separate country, and they signed by treaty. Listen to what it says in Revelation 12. I'm going to start in verse 14 to 16. And to the woman, that's the church, isn't it? were given two wings of a great eagle. Ancient Israel came out of Egypt on the wings of a great eagle. They walked every step of the way. We have automobiles today. That she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. What if, and this is not doctrine, I don't even know if this even has a similarity of the truth, but what if Texas were to secede from the Union? and become a separate state, and the ingathering of the elect where they would be protected for three and a half years from the mark of the beast was to take place. And it says in verse six fifteen, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as of a flood after the woman. That's the armies of the new world order that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So they were going to come after the church and the earth helped the woman. God Almighty supernaturally helped the woman in the church in the wilderness. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. That's the New World Army that was cast out after the church. 